Welcome to Motoring Box. Today you join me here by the roadside in the Australian Outback because we're looking at one of the most infamous cars to have ever been designed and built in this great country. A car which polarised the Australian public's opinion quite unlike anything that came before it or since and one that suffered from slow sales as a result. Despite the fact that it was released over 20 years ago and was on sale for just four short years, somehow you still see them absolutely everywhere on the roads today. If you're an Australian, this car needs no introduction. But for everyone else, it's the Ford AU Falcon. It's the mid-1990s in Australia, and local car manufacturers Ford and Holden are once again facing off against each other with their large, locally built rear-wheel drive sedans, the Falcon and the Commodore. The two were neck and neck, trading punches with sales in the showrooms and swapping paint on the racetracks. For Australian car fans, it was an absolutely epic time to be alive. But then Holden launched their new VT Commodore in 1997, after more than five years and $600 million dues worth of development. Australian car buyers fell in love with it and sales took off, with everyone else awaiting Ford's response. The very next year, they returned fire with this, the Ford AU Falcon. Powering the AU was the latest iteration of Ford Australia's legendary four litre straight six engine, fitted to a car that was lighter, stiffer, more aerodynamic and more economical than the model which preceded it. And for the first time in the Falcon's history, independent rear suspension became available as standard on some models and optional on others. But none of this mattered, because it wasn't the AU Falcon's advanced features which made the headlines, it was quite simply how it looked. Now of course, the styling has mellowed out a little bit over the years, but imagine you're a Ford man back in the late 1990s. You had the ED Falcon, the EF, the EL, and then this thing came along. It really was like a slap in the face with a wet fish. The AU Falcon used Ford's New Edge design language, which we first saw on the Taurus. And while it has been used to better effect here, it was still a radical departure from the Falcon we all knew and loved. I was finishing high school at the time, and I remember absolutely hating how this thing looked. Unfortunately for Ford, I wasn't alone. The styling of the AU became a contentious issue with the car buying public, and the problem was further exacerbated by some awkward design choices throughout the model lineup. Speaking of models, let's run through the AU Falcon range. We begin with the Falcon Forte, which is a bare bones model which had air conditioning and an automatic gearbox as standard, but not a lot else. It had a waterfall style front grille which scared small children, and no frills bodywork which sat high above 15 inch steel wheels, with one of the worst plastic wheel cover designs you've ever seen in your life. The Forte is your snag or sausage. Basic food, but it does the job. Next up, you had the Falcon Futura, which added a body-coloured front grille, ABS brakes, cruise control and alloy wheels. It's the bread, something which you probably should have received in the first place. From there you had the Falcon S, which added alloy wheels, sport suspension and a rear spoiler. It's the cheese, for a little bit of added substance. Next you had the Falcon XR6, which was the high performance version of the AU Falcon range. For your money, you got a unique quad headlight front clip and body kit, a rear spoiler, sports suspension, and a higher power output from the engine. It's the Onion, added punch for those who wanted it. There was also an even sportier XR6 VCT. Next up, you had the Fairmont, which was the entry level luxury version of the AU Falcon range. It had a honeycomb style front grille, 80 second headlight off delay, a higher spec dashboard with wood grain look inserts, a nicer interior, unique 15 inch alloy wheels, dual horns and Fairmont badging on the boot. It's the source, it tops off the package and helps bring everything else together nicely. And lastly you had your Fairmont gear, which had its own unique alloy wheels, even more wood grain, independent rear suspension as standard, and the same engine as the sporty XR6 VCT. It's the mustard, but we're not done yet. 
And that's because the Forte and the Fairmont gear could be optioned with Ford's 5.0-litre V8. Or the same engine could be used to turn an XR6 into an XR8. And then there were two even more powerful versions created by Tickford Vehicle Engineering. The TE50 with 200 kilowatts and the TS50 with 220 kilowatts. More sausage for power hungry customers. But the AU Falcon I've got here is the Fairmont gear with this six cylinder VCT engine. The fancy as fuck version of the AU Falcon range and still with enough sausage to keep you satisfied. Mm. But while the Fairmont gear may have indeed been fancy, it certainly didn't look that way. Now this particular Fairmont gear sold brand new in 2001 for around $50,000 dues. But from where I'm sitting, the buyer ended up receiving a car which looks very much like a base model. The Fairmont gear had its own unique alloy wheels, but there's very little else about it which screams premium. And I guess a lot of that can be blamed on the AU Falcon's design. Without any of the body kits or rear spoilers which were available at the time as optional extras, buyers found the styling to be both offensive and dull at the same time. From certain angles I can see moments of inspiration, like how the boot lid curve continues down past the taillights in one smooth motion. There's also this little flick that continues up into the taillights. The C-pillars too look kind of cool, and I like the door profile with this crease which runs the entire length of the car. But none of this matters, because the best part is under here. This is arguably the AU Falcon's party piece, Ford's Australian developed 4 litre straight 6 engine. Now let me just clear one thing up from the get go for our overseas viewers, this is not a barra. What this is, is an engine which can trace its roots all the way back to the 1960s, where it started life as Ford America's 170 cubic inch straight six. Over the years, Ford Australia enlarged it to 250 cubic inches, or 4.1 litres. Developed a cross-flow cylinder head in the 70s before switching to an aluminium head in the 80s and adding fuel injection and then redesigning the engine in the 90s to make it a 4 litre with a single overhead cam. Then they added variable length intake runners before finally introducing variable cam timing to create this, the 4 litre Intec VCT. A few years later in the BA Falcon, this engine received dual overhead cams to become the Barra, which means this is Barra's old man. The 4.0-litre Intake VCT was a formidable engine back in the day, developing 168 kilowatts of power and 370 newton metres of torque in the Fairmont gear, and slightly more in the sporty XR6 Falcon. To put those figures into perspective, Holden had to supercharge their GM-sourced 3.8-litre Ecotec V6 in the VT Commodore to simply match the power and torque figures this thing put out as standard. In my mind, the Intec VCT and the Barra are two of the best engines to have ever come out of Australia. And the fact that Ford only fitted this engine to the Fairmont gear and the XR6 VCT makes this car a little bit special. So while it might look a little bit drab on the outside, it goes like a shower of shit. Well, let's not beat around the bush here. The AU Falcon is no sports car. I mean, 0 to 100 takes around eight seconds. But it's the torque which the four litre engine produces that helps it feel effortless. You don't have to rev the tits off it in order to make progress. I mean, I've got a five litre V8 Fairlane at home which came out just a couple of years before this car. But the engine in this makes more power and more torque. I mean, why would you go for the V8 when the 6 was this good? But a Bonza engine can only be appreciated by the driver. To everyone else, you're just a bloke in an AU. So the exterior styling may not have been for everyone, but you've absolutely got to take a Captain Cook at what's going on in here. And that's because Ford's new edge oval fetish really kicked into overdrive in the interior of this car. The air vents are ovals, the buttons are ovals, the clock, instrument cluster, shifter surround, door handles and speakers, they're all ovals. Ovals everywhere. 
The Fairmont gear came standard with these leather and cloth combination seats. They're comfortable, look good, and thanks to the cloth sections, they're breathable too. Which in the sweaty Australian summer is actually very important. Now, if you were a masochist, you had the option of specking a full black leather interior. And many people actually did. As I found out when I was on the hunt for a Fairmont gear, the majority did have the black leather interior. And they were all shot to shit, bar none. I mean, the leather was old and cracking and the seat bolsters were also worn all the way through to the canvas. Somehow the leather sections in this interior still look fantastic. So score one for me. So what else did the fancy as fuck Fairmont gear come with? Well, you did get a leather steering wheel with volume and cruise controls mounted around one of the stickiest horn pads you've ever seen in your life. Because who wouldn't want that, right? I don't really know what Ford was going for here, but I don't think they expected it to age quite like this. Next up, you have the dash cluster with its oval gauges and oval warning light arrays. There's not really much else going on up here, but it does at least have a little LCD display at the bottom, displaying the odometer, trip computer, open door diagram, and also what gear you're in. Mine also came standard with a little friendly fly who I named Barry. G'day mate. How's it going in there? Barry? Barry? Most of the other dash controls in the Fairmont gear are handled by this thing, which Ford calls the Message Display Center. You can check your average fuel usage, the remaining range you've got left, instant fuel usage, average speed, and you can also set an overspeed alarm. There's also a bunch of climate controls over here so you can set the mood exactly how you'd like it. And then you have the analog clock, but who really gives a shit? And at least we've got this nice bit of wood grain which runs all the way across to the other side of the dash. Below the MDC are four oval shaped buttons which pretty much do what you'd expect. The first one locks the doors. So this is the one you want to hit when you're being chased by killer kangaroos or members of the local population who are on ice. Seeing as that happens in rougher, more remote areas, the second button should also prove helpful. This one gives the antenna shaft a hit of Viagra. So you can tune into those city radio stations a little bit longer before they fade out of range. The third button here turns off the traction control so you can go and do some single pegs. And the fourth button here turns on the rear window demister. And down the bottom here, you've got your factory Ford premium sound head unit. Aside from looking like it's been hit with an ugly stick, this thing holds six CDs in dash and does a decent job of supplying the tunes. But it'll also give you the shits because every time it turns on, it seems to have a different idea of what any given volume number should sound like. She'll be right. Down in the center console here, you've got your four speed shifter. And there's also an economy button for when you're trying to stretch your next servo visit until payday. And a center console, which provides storage for your CD and coin collections. In the back, there's plenty of space for three of your mates. Although they'll have to amuse themselves because there's not a lot else going on back here. Perhaps they can go on Facebook and look up AU Falcons doing incredible things. Because like I said at the start, despite being 20 years old, you still see AU Falcons in places they shouldn't be, moving things they weren't designed for, and usually being treated like shit in the process. Perhaps then, the AU Falcon is the cockroach of the Australian car industry. It might not be much to look at, but it'll still be here long after we're gone. As you may have noticed, my AU Falcon has received similar treatment. I found it on Facebook Marketplace where it was one of the cheapest AU Falcons available. It might look shiny on the outside, but its service history is patchy at best and the scars on its silver skin hint at the abuse it has endured over the past 20 years. So you might imagine then that I've bought a bucket of bolts, which is nearing the end of its life. But you'd be wrong, because this car is just getting started. So first things first, I'll admit that I've never actually driven an AU Falcon prior to purchasing this one, and it has been quite a surprise. Now of course, a few things have gone wrong with this car in the time that I've owned it. 
but I'll cover those in a future video and really none of them were very serious problems. Certainly no showstoppers, that's for sure. So what can I say about the AU Falcon? If I had to sum it up in one word, I would probably say smooth because the steering is smooth. The engine is even more so. The gearbox has not put a foot wrong and the suspension is set up perfectly for these fast country roads. It is far better than a car of this age or monetary value has any right to be. But what I think about this car is something else. From in here, I'm loving it. It feels like you could drive the entire length of Australia and both you and the car would be ready to turn around and do it all over again. But to me, this car is very much like a pair of tracksuit pants or tracky dacks as we call them here in Australia. Once you take looks out of the equation and not give a damn about what anyone else thinks, it's exactly what you want to be wearing. And that's the Ford AU Falcon, an all-round good car, but with a face that many simply weren't ready to accept. And I think that's kind of sad. Because as human beings, we don't have the right to judge anything or anyone by their covers. We judge others, not by the best that they could be, but instead by the worst thoughts in our own hearts. While some might look at the AU and dismiss it as an ugly oval shaped blob, I see solid, dependable family transport developed by a company with a proud history of building honest cars for hardworking Australian families. And that's something you just don't get here anymore. To me, the AU Falcon is a car which deserves far more praise than it ever received and one which will no doubt be forgotten as time rolls on. Goodbye, old friend.